quickly. Recent reports indicate that the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission is leveraging Ethereum's transition to proof-of-stake consensus to potentially reclassify it as a security. The agency has reportedly issued subpoenas to three prominent crypto companies seeking records related to the Ethereum Foundation. According to a recent Fortune report, this investigation could pave the way for the SEC to officially classify Ethereum as a security, potentially complicating the approval process for Ethereum ETF applications, including those from BlackRock and others. Furthermore, the Ethereum Foundation disclosed via GitHub that it may be under investigation by a state authority. This development comes amidst growing skepticism regarding the SEC's approval of Ethereum ETF applications by the May 23 deadline, similar to its handling of Bitcoin ETFs on January 10. Bloomberg ETF analysts Eric Balchanese and James Sartre suggest that the likelihood of Ethereum ETF approvals is now as low as 25%. Balchanese highlighted the SEC's comparatively subdued approach towards Ethereum ETFs compared to Bitcoin ETFs last year, noting a lack of engagement with applicants or pertinent inquiries. Despite the mounting challenges, Mark Yusko, founder and CIO of Morgan Creek Capital, remains cautiously optimistic about the prospects of ETF approvals for Ethereum. However, like the Bloomberg ETF analysts, Yusko doesn't foresee approvals by the May deadline, suggesting they may be announced post the November elections. Ever feel like you're wasting your money on things that don't really matter? Stop. You don't have time. Don't miss out on this 2025 bull run. Educate yourself now. Don't spend $12.50 on junk. Educate yourself on how to be successful in crypto using our Crypto Cheat Guide. Unlock the secrets of crypto and make smarter investments today. Visit the website now and the link in the description for your exclusive copy. Start your journey to crypto success today. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to drop your comment and observations in the comment section below. Thanks and enjoy the video. Definitely FUD, you know, definitely fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, that is that is how the incumbents deal with technological innovation, right? So blockchains are the future of computing, full stop. And they're not, you know, the technology is not going away. And I've been shilling this book, you know, that Chris Dixon wrote, Read, Write, Own, for yeah. anybody who wants to understand why, you know, this thing that I've been talking about for, for almost 10 years about the cycle of technology from the mainframe yeah. to the microchip, to the personal computer, to the internet, to the mobile net, and now the truth net, which is the internet of, of blockchains and, and why you know, AI is not it, right? AI is a tool that's been around 75 years. It ran on you know, big computers and it ran on personal computers and it ran on the internet and then it ran on the mobile net and now eventually it run on blockchains. I would say it's a 75-year overnight success story. But the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt is spread every single time there's an innovation in technology that threatens incumbents' livelihood. So you can go back to the internet, right? AT&T and Verizon tried to kill, literally, the internet because they didn't like what you and I are doing right now. Voice over internet protocol is free. They charge $3 a minute for long distance. You know, we're far away from each other. And they liked charging $3 a minute for that. So they tried to get a bill passed and they spread all these rumors about how the internet was bad. And thankfully, I would say, you know, Al Gore did not invent the internet, but he did kill that bill, which stopped them from, from over-regulating it. And, you know, the same thing's true now. The banks are being disrupted by these chains. And financial services as we know it, which has had a good 838 year run under its current form, based on trust, is being displaced by truth. Blockchains give you truth. And therefore, as we think about, you know, how would you stop these these chains, these these innovations from happening? Well, We'll, we'll overregulate them. Well, because yeah. you don't have any jurisdiction because they're not securities. Well, then, then we'll classify them as securities. Or we'll try to classify them as commodities and get some other regulator to, you know, collaborate, you know, to uh, work with us. Well, they tried that with Bitcoin. They tried to overregulate. They tried to regulate by um, attack on 
you know, new technology and, and new innovation. And what happened? The courts said, Gary, you've <clears throat> overstepped your bounds. And now we have Bitcoin ETFs and, and they're part of the culture of the future of financial services. For sure. So now next up is Ethereum. So that's a long-winded way of saying it's FUD, it's expected, and the reality is the courts forced the SEC and Chairman Gensler to approve the Bitcoin ETF. Yeah. There have been no well, such court ruling, no such lawsuit to force his hand on Ethereum. Right. Therefore, he can do all of this, you know, FUD campaign to make people afraid that it's not going to happen. And as we all as we all know, people will buy the rumor, whatever that rumor is, whether it's new technology adoption, whether it's new chips, whether it's new products, and then they some of them will sell the news. And so you'll get this run up in price. And then if it doesn't happen or it does happen, you know, they'll they'll sell out of fear. If it doesn't happen, they'll sell out of I'm going to take my profits if it does. And we saw that after the Bitcoin ETFs and then they went back up and now yeah. there's been some, you know, downside pressure. Ethereum ran along with it, got all the way up over $5,000 and, you know, or $4,000, sorry. And Four, now, yeah. bam, it's back down again. As expected, Eric and James have faced significant criticism from Ethereum investors for their cautious stance on ETF approvals. Responding to skepticism about their credibility stemming from their recent remarks on ETFs, Eric emphasized that their predictions are driven by credibility, not biased towards any particular cryptocurrency. He expressed confidence in the SEC's eventual approval, yet highlighted the importance of accuracy. Despite their positive outlook, Eric acknowledged the current unfavorable circumstances. In another statement, Eric suggested that the odds of approval could significantly improve if the SEC provided feedback, indicating a willingness to cooperate with regulators. However, he noted the agency's limited time frame for such feedback, expressing doubts about a sudden change in approach. Eric highlighted circumstantial evidence suggesting the SEC may be preparing for denial, citing stronger indications compared to previous Bitcoin ETF cases. Moreover, Eric pointed out that there's no legal obligation for the SEC to approve the ETFs, highlighting Chairman Gensler's evolving perspective on Ethereum's classification. Mark Yusko emphasized the pivotal role of influential entities like BlackRock a prominent ETF applicant and recent supporter of Ethereum-based projects. Yusko cited BlackRock's substantial investment in an Ethereum blockchain-based fund as evidence of growing institutional interest, indicating a favorable environment for Ethereum ETFs in the future. BlackRock is going to do what BlackRock is going to do. Yeah. They are the largest asset manager in the world. I, I, I told people for a year that there was no question in my mind. As soon as they announced they were going after the, the Bitcoin ETF. It, not only was it going to get approved, they were going to be first. Right. Now, you know, they, they decided to crown them all at the same time. But mm -hmm. um, and, the and look, Bitcoin has, I mean, BlackRock has applied for an ETF in Ethereum as well. I think the challenge now is who has the bigger, you know, stick, shall we say, Everything is political. Appointments yeah. of these, you know, unelected people are by the current administration that, that happens to appoint them. It happens to be an election year. Look, Ms. Warren is pretty anti all of this. Why? Well, my thesis, I won't, I won't put words in her mouth, but my thesis is you look at her largest campaign contributors. They happen to be large financial institutions that have a great deal at stake if they are disrupted. So it's not surprising to me that she would craft legislation to slow down the, the disruptive technology. Okay. The fact that it's an election Always year and that agenda. she's show me the, who, who said it, show me the incentive. I'll show you the outcome. That is the way the world has always worked. And you know, here's the problem, political problem, as I see it, it costs from what I've read and, and studied, about a hundred million dollars to secure a Senate seat in the United States, $100 million. Most of us don't have that. So if we want to run, 
unless your name is Meg Whitman, who spent 103 million or 108 million, I can't remember, mm. of her own money. Yeah. She lost, unfortunately, but, but she spent over $100 million of her own money. Unless you're her or someone like her, you have to raise $100 million. Well, it turns out if people write you one, 10, 20, $50 million checks, Paul, they expect something. Yeah. And that's the way our system works in a world where you allow unlimited contributions to, you know, PACs and super PACs. So either fix campaign finance and make people so they're not on the payroll of special interests or do term limits like the old days, right? And when the founders or the framers set it up two years, you left the farm, you went, you served, and then you went back. You didn't stay for six or eight or 10 or 50. You stayed for two. And maybe two is too short. Maybe we need four or six. I don't know what the right number is, but it in 20, it in 40, and it in 50. Yeah, lifetime. And there's also, it's also vitality, right? You know, yeah. when are you the most vital? When are you the most, um, yeah, I, I hate to say it, but I watched some speeches of our current president when he was 35. I'm like, yeah, right on. I agree with you. I don't say that now. The Institutional Digital Liquidity Fund launched by BlackRock on Wednesday marks the asset management giant's debut into tokenized asset funds. According to BlackRock's press release, the fund's bill token is fully backed by cash, U.S. Treasury bills, and repurchase agreements, offering yield payouts through blockchain channels to token holders on a daily basis. BlackRock has partnered with Security Eye as a transfer agent and tokenization platform, with BNY Mellon handling custody of the fund's assets. Other key participants include Coinbase, Fireblocks, Anchorage Digital Bank, and BitGo. The tokenization of real-world assets, such as bonds and funds, represents a burgeoning sector that bridges traditional finance players like BlackRock with the digital assets industry. This convergence is driving rapid growth, with projections estimating the industry to surpass $16 trillion by 2030. Regarding Mark Yusko's interview and Eric's tweets, the sentiment leans towards skepticism regarding the likelihood of Ethereum ETF approvals, especially given the imminent deadline. Feel free to share your thoughts and observations in the comments below. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.